Remember, to celebrate 100,000 subscribers, March is about giving back to the community. And this month's charity is the P-Flag, America's first and oldest LGBTQ action group. You might think that LGBT issues aren't worth paying attention to anymore, but maybe somebody you know or care about is struggling with their identity and they could use your help. Or even if they had the confidence to come out, they are facing harassment or bullying as was sadly the case with Next Benedict. Even today, like, what the hey? Hey, that rhymes. Donate today. Remember, if you are struggling, you are loved, you are wanted, and you got this. Now on with the video. I'm sorry you've been feeling so bad about yourself, but come on, you're like the boss of the mental institution, and you're what, five? That's pretty cool. Why has an American Dad episode appealed to me so much? Like, this show meant to make you laugh makes me cry. Like, I have favorite episodes, don't get me wrong, but none so much as this. Hi, I'm Kitty Monk, and I'm here to talk to you about American Dad. Or more specifically, the episode Productive Panic. Now, I'm a YouTuber. I'm an English major. And I guess by that merit, because of my career, it means I'm a a writer. Well, that, and I also write Beetlejuice fanfics, so even if I'm not professionally a writer, because some people think YouTubing isn't a real job, I still write in my spare time, even if I don't so much as do it nowadays. Not because I lost the passion, just I have no time. Ever since I started YouTubing, it's made a lot of other stuff much more relatable for me, especially when it comes to writing. Like, in Bojack horseman when Princess Carolyn gives Diane a speech about how sometimes a work meant to entertain people can be more impactful than a work made to inform or persuade people, because this can be a form of escapism for both the writer and the reader. And I decided that one day I would write something that would make little girls like me feel less alone. Then maybe write this other book. Maybe this book does that too. Or how in Disenchantment, Bean found therapy by writing a play about her parents, and when she couldn't put it on because of the law, she just talked on stage for a couple of minutes, and it was able to help her work through a very stressful dream. My whole life I just wanted her to be there, but it turns out the best mothering I ever got was from a fat guy with a red mustache. She's whining about her dad. Is it bad I sometimes imagine my life as either the free churro episode from Bojack or as an ID documentary? Just saying, sometimes if I sound angry in a video, I probably am in real life. Like during the Queen Moon video I did a couple of years back, I had a huge argument the night before, which I'm not getting into, and I was still angry and hurt the day after. So I channeled that into my rantings and it became one of my highest rated videos at the time. And then there's this episode. Normally, American Dad episodes don't hit the waterworks, at least for me, except for this episode. And you'll soon see why. So let's discuss. This episode begins one night at Hideki's house, aka Toshi's house. We recently adopted a five-year-old child. That's not my impressive thing. My impressive thing is my new jacket. We don't get a lot of Toshi plots, do we? Yeah, Catherine, you're right. We really don't. The Spelling Bee episode was all about his mom and his sister, not him. Or there's a bunch of subplots about his father and Stan. Look, I get it. Toshi is probably a hard character to write for because his one-note joke is that he speaks Japanese and only Japanese, but he's like the only one of Steve's friends to have never gotten his own episode. Or even one-on-one -on -one time with Steve. Change that, writers. I command you. On the offset, Hideki's house is awesome sauce and full of rich, successful people. Or at least successful, motivated people. And peacocks. Both literal and people who dress up for the attention. You nervous about the peacocks? Me too. They scream so loud, scares me like crazy. No cap, facts. And that seems to make Stan and Francine a little intimidated, which makes sense. They're the worst party people. Francine could talk about stuff she knows nothing about for hours on end, prematurely laugh at jokes, and then get pushed in the pool. Or Roger could accidentally give <gasps> a 
Spider-Man backpack, or a mountain man could try to kidnap Haley, or Stan could take a crap in the pool, or badmouth Ellie Wiesel. And yes, these were all episodes. Francine says that she isn't nervous because parties are anxiety storms where people try to talk to you and examine you like a zoo animal or a piece of meat. It's because she feels, I guess you could say, and I'm not using this word lightly, I mean nothing by it, lesser. I hate these Hideki parties. Everyone has all these impressive things going on to talk about, and I don't. They all look at me like I'm a big nothing. Now, part of me hates when they do this because Francine has accomplished some stuff, like in the episode with the fireman. Even if Terry screaming was one of my favorite jokes in the whole show. I mean, this girl has a garden made up of every man she's ever done it with, and it was on a cover, and it has a native tribe that has never seen a white man. But at the same time, I also understand this feeling immensely. It's very easy to to compare yourself to others. Like, when I would go to family parties, they would be like, Do you have a boyfriend yet? No. Well, your cousin just got married and she already has 10 kids. How are things? I mean, I'm alive, I guess. Oh, well, that same cousin that had 10 kids and just got married, she also became the president of Hot Wheels and started a charity that puts hamsters through college. I gotta be in math. Plus, it fits in with the episode's theme. The harm that comes from comparing yourself to others, especially when it comes to something you create. It gives birth to insecurity, and insecurity gives birth to jealousy. Francine could feel content with her life, even if she's just cooking and cleaning all day, but compared to, let's say, Jeff and Barry, who are doing a project together, or Hideki, who's a major businessman, it's nothing or it makes her seem plain old average. Which, yeah, maybe this might sound tone deaf coming from me, even if I don't consider myself all that famous, but there's no harm in being quote unquote average, so long as you're happy or satisfied or content with your circumstances. Plus, considering how prior episodes had Stan evaluate Francine like a show dog, especially before they went to get togethers, maybe he planted that little seed of insecurity, and it just kept building. Stan encourages Francine to tell the party goers about her new hobby, pottery, which she is not willing to do, so she tries to lay low. My pottery, Stan? Oh my god! That's not impressive! I'm not even good at it! Come on, you're Francine! The wife of me, Stan! Francine, speaking from experience, the trick is to be absolutely silent or go by the wall or a corner or the food. That way, you're hidden, but you could still eat. However, I feel like couldn't she just fib? Like, are they really gonna evaluate her pottery or go to her little workspace and examine it? Because this will be important later, while everybody is explaining what's going on in their lives, Roger mentions there's an important art dealer at the party, Gary Gogo. He's the Mr. Beast of art dealing. But hey, it's only a fairy. That's Mad Pat. Sorry, I've never watched Mr. Beast, but I did go to his restaurant once in American Dream, and it sucked. But I did write my name on the wall. I heard Gary Gogo is here. They say he's totally over the top ridiculous. That's me, I'm Gary Gogo. Ah, I thought it was gonna be me. But as she doesn't want to confront him, Francine goes to hang out with the little kids. So nice to find someone at this party I can just be with. No one's trying to impress anyone else. It's a good vibe on the top stair. Again, I relate to this so much, they do not judge you, and children can smell if you're evil or not. Wait, but where's Akiko? However, she's cornered by Hideki. The elusive Francine! What's new with you? Mm, meatball. We can wait. What I like is how Adeki is pretty attentive as a party host. He's perfectly polite, and while he does show off, well, who isn't doing that there? Heck, even Steve is showing off his skin mark, or his zin, whatever it is, I forget. I think it's a rash. I have this little rash that so far no doctor can identify. I'm seeing a lot of specialists. It's become somewhat of a full-time job. Ah. And 
again, with no hint of embarrassment, unlike usual. I'm sure if Francine just mentioned she had a hobby or an interest, nobody would demean her, or Hideki would be like, oh, cool, and then move on. Heck, there's an art dealer there. If Francine goes to him, maybe he would be happy to give her some advice or look over her work or help her network. Again, I know this is bugging me, but who is really gonna verify the pottery? Private investigators hired by Scientologists? Francine gets nervous and goes into the bathroom. The sanctuary of all anxious people! Oh my god, there's pottery right there. Holy cow, a trigger. <sighs> We're all waiting for you when you come out, Francine. Yeah, that ain't creepy at all. Francine steals a plunger and escapes out the window with her aggressively average body. And wait, Hideki is so freaking rich that he has a valet at his own freaking house? Lucky. But does he have a garage? I don't have a garage. Eh, I don't even have a car. But it seems like the universe desperately wants to keep Francine at this party. Maybe this is where she belongs. <laughs> Francine, that's very bad for my peacock. Where do you belong? The next morning, Francine appears, looking like me after I spend all night editing. Well, crunch time. The party's over and I should move on, but I feel like I'm stuck there emotionally. The family leaves to go do their important crap with only Francine and Klaus remaining. The losers. The loser babies. Francine is still feeling upset from last night and tries to get some advice from Klaus. How can you bear to live like this all the time? Well, I try to picture three spheres floating in complex orbit until I disassociate from my body. That wasn't the answer I was expecting. I just think of full-on Spongebob episodes or hum the song, Why We Build the Wall in My Head. <laughs> Don't tell me you don't do the same. Realizing Klaus is a loser just like her, and probably actually requires therapy, she decides to show him something. Something she should have talked about last night. Her pottery. As it turns out, Francine's pottery isn't anything special. And I kind of like that. Normally, with these kind of things, the person would be insecure, but then we'd see that their work is really good. Here, it's plain old average. It's not going to change the face of America. America, or help orphan children in gem mines get clean water. It's just a fun hobby. And the bowls she makes? Yeah, they're nothing special. They're lopsided, unpainted, amateur. But she's insecure about her skills as an artist because, again, they're not that good. But whenever she finishes making a bowl, she breaks it. Oh my god, I could never. Like, I criticize myself immensely as an artist, but I could never destroy my own work. That's like bludgeoning a baby to death. Break them? Why? Because! It never turns out good enough! It isn't impressive in any way! It's a flop! Okay, time for personal stuff. Why do I like this episode? Well, if you couldn't guess by now, this episode speaks to me. In many ways, I feel a lot like Francine. I understand the feeling of writing something or creating something and feeling it's never good enough. Especially, you might not believe this, but YouTube videos. Even if the only saving grace is, I can choose whether or not I tell you guys personal details, like my name or photos or personal stories or stuff like that. 98% of the time, it's just a cartoon and my voice. But that doesn't mean I think my work is immaculate or perfect. Honestly, it sucks watching my old videos because all I see are mistakes I made. Like, there will be times when I'm talking to my parents about my videos and I'll be like, oh yeah, this old video I made, <sighs> it's a piece of crap. And they'll be like, Appa, stop it. It's not a piece of crap. Why would you say such a thing? Yes, it is. You don't understand. You made nothing except for me. Heck, I think what makes it more personal is I've been in her situation. I used to make up my own shows, sometimes I still do, and then write scripts for them. And when I was in high school, one of my friends convinced me to read my script aloud to the rest
rest of my friend group. And one of my old friends who I no longer talk to wasn't interested or supportive and kind of annoyed when I did it and he really expressed it. I just felt so upset and embarrassed that I stopped writing for almost a year. Also, fun fact, since a few people have been asking, said friend is the reason why I'm called Kitty Monk. Because back in 2020, he saw me in a black dress that went down to my ankles, like the kind that Lilith Clawthorn or Rosie wear, and it's the type of dress I always wanted to wear, and I was super happy when I finally got to buy it at H&M. And then, rather than keeping his mouth shut when he saw me wear it for the first time, when I was scared to wear it, he called me a Franciscan monk. Idiot. Benedictines wear all black. I know. So, if you're wondering why I'm called Kitty Monk, that's partially why. It's a mean, critical nickname that's stuck, like mittens from the Owl House. Story aside, something I've realized is that while I'm likely going to compare myself to others, almost inevitably, it's both good and bad. People, especially my parents, will tell me, oh my god, you have so many subscribers, and then I'll be like, please, Lydia and Johnny and Shady and Blooms and Mark and Saber Spark, they have way more than me. Or, oh, your cosplay is so amazing. Please, I'm a pleb. I bought all this. Why are you praising me? I have no skill. Aren't you supposed to make your own costumes? Something I learned is I had to figure out why why I was comparing myself, or why they were better. Maybe they realized their niches a lot quicker than I did, so they racked up more subscribers. Maybe they've been doing this a lot longer. Maybe they had access to better resources or networks. Maybe at one point, they were as low as I was. Heck, as a cosplayer, I realized you have to ask questions to improve, and most cosplayers, they're happy to answer. Sorry if this went on a bit long, but the point is, as an artist, yes, this episode is relatable and I love it for it. And it's nice that it happened. Klaus tries an exercise with Francine. What's the worst that could happen if you didn't break it? If you showed it to someone? Uh, not me, of course. A real person. Oh my god, Klaus, did you just hear my little personal rant? It came from deep within my heart. They would laugh and the laughter would feel like bullets and kill me. Exactly, Franny. Klaus says she's overreacting because he's not an artist. He doesn't understand. The truth is, no one will even care. Plus, other people's opinions of you are none of your business. Well, in my line of work, it's partially my business. Cosplays aside, how do I know how to improve my videos if I don't listen to the masses? I mean, a lot of you at conventions said I was adorable, so I ramped up the adorable factor. Or some of you guys said I was too preachy, so now I've tried to limit that to only if I'm talking about, say, real-life issues. Or some of you say I overuse Catherine, so I don't use Catherine as much, or my intros were too long, or they also said you have a tendency to go off script, so can we please go back, kitty? I'm sorry. Klaus suggests that Francine should display her bowl in a coffee shop owned by one of his boys. It takes a lot of courage, but Francine puts her bowl on a shelf with a name tag. I'm proud of you, Franny. Good job. But this is scarier. They won't see you. You remain anonymous, so they can comment whatever they want without a hint of care. Oh, well, at least you'll know if they're being honest. He's the meanest, cruelest guy in Langley. He stole <coughs> everything. I hope that's not literally. <laughs> nice shirt, Lord. <coughs> Oh, thank gosh. This Stelio Contos wannabe goes up to the bowl, and rather than use it as a bedpan, he compliments her. Oh, <laughs> that bowl! Is that about how big the salads are here? Oh, that's sweet. The next morning, Francine learns that her bowl has become an overnight success. It's super powerful, and she is now an influential super artist. Other artists want to use her as inspiration for their own paintings. The paparazzi follow her every move. Gogo wants to be her agent, and her self-confidence is back. All because of a freaking bowl. A simplistic bowl, which amazingly is not painted or glazed or anything. It's just a bowl. Francine Smith, I'm Gary Gogo, the biggest art dealer in the world, and I love your bowl. Francine learns that her bowl is a success, not only in Langley, but abroad. It's achieved global success.
I made a bowl. He likes it. I like it? No. I feel that without it, I would cease to exist, okay? It's ineffable. Well, it's funny you say that. Granted, I do want to say that I kind of noticed something about the episode. It's not a flaw, it's just something I noticed. This episode probably wasn't recorded at a studio. It was recorded in like a closet or under a bed or something like that. This episode premiered in 2023, so timeline-wise, it was probably recorded in like 2021 or 2020. 22. During current events. Like, you can kind of hear it. Like, the voice actor for Gogo probably went in his closet or something, and then a plane flew overhead, or I don't know. It reminded me that the world is good and that love is possible. It made me cry. 30 years of therapy and not a drip. Then boom! Again, ever since I've gotten to YouTube, I've noticed more if an actor, like, isn't in the studio because their lines won't feel as clean. Or if they talk too loud and that almost blew out the mic. Mostly because I make mistakes like that all the time. Again, not condemning the episode, it's just fun to notice. Gogo invites Francine to dinner at his house. What a party? You mean the place where she felt embarrassed? <laughs> Who cares about that crap? No, she loves parties, unlike me. I'm loving this feeling, Klaus. Maybe this is the thing I've always wanted? For people to think I'm impressive and then tell me nonstop? Oh, I know that feeling, trust me. It's like the wonderful song from Wicked. The wizard was on to something. Or the wizard and I, but wonderful is catchier. Klaus tells Francine to continue to ride this high, and he'll help her as manager. I'm loving what I'm seeing, Francine. Oh, look at Hideki, being supportive. Francine goes to the party and learns that she has a nickname in the ARC community, the Bowl Mother. The woman of the hour, the Bowl Mother, Francine Smith. Oh, it reminds me of Mama Kitty. Really, was this episode written for me? I know it probably wasn't, but if it was, thank you, writers. Francine gets to meet other important people, like Lady Gaga knockoff, and discovers that her bowl is important outside of people being fans. It's like Scrody McBooger balls, intriguing when it probably wasn't meant to be that way. It's even saved lives. And that's how the bowl saved my life. This, this right here is why I do what I do. However, then she gets an important question. What's next? Next? Uh, I guess a dish, or a petri dish, or a salad bowl, not like a soup one. Franny, one thing I've learned is that you don't give out big details of upcoming works to fans. It's like you're jinxing yourself. So back in the bathroom, silent as a lamb. My life is in your hands! Vesuvio Schnoozle hooked me up with his guy at Alfa Romeo, and I ordered 17 of them! They're crossing the Atlantic right now! Francine learns that the dude who painted her lady parts is beautiful! Well, he has an art space she can use, abroad, with some awesome sauce stuff, and a posse. Yeah, I'm not famous because I don't have a posse, unless you count Fizzy. Francine doesn't know what to do, so she tries to do things that inspire inspiration. And not like watching TV or taking a shower or listening to the same song 500 times like us plebs. Get me an ATV and a bodysuit! <laughs> Francine goes through the many stages of work. I need to work! Everybody out! Except you, Delmonico. No! Delmonico! It's so hard! Yeah, I totally don't do any of this. The next morning, Francine zigs and zags by making an actually perfect bowl. Oh, good job. Wait, no, it's actually two bowls. Holy crap, it's beautiful! Francine decides to celebrate by sleeping. You earned it. And tells Klaus to send the completed work to the art dealer guy. Klaus, I am going to sleep for the next 36 hours. I'm not to be disturbed. The new piece is on the table. It's ready for pickup. Only she wasn't clear enough. Or Klaus has zero critical thinking skills. Eh, either or, or both. So he keeps the bowls and uses them for snacks. Why are my stuck-together bowls still on the table? The chip and dip? 
I've been using that for my scoops and salsa. That's my art! Wait, maybe that's your next art period. It's symbolic of world hunger. And how, actually, world hunger only exists because of, like, I don't know. I heard it actually, I don't know. But what did he send Gogo? A literal lump of clay. <sighs> Idiot. Lump is new ball! We gotta get you on a jet back to Langley. Oh wait, not idiot. Maybe he's a Savin. Savin? What are those two? Francine's new magnum opus is the lump, and it gets her even more success than the bowl. She even gets to be on Morning Mimosa, her dream, outside of all of those other times she was on Morning Mimosa. But this time, it's not about gold top nuts, so she probably won't get made fun of. They don't matter. Only lump does. What is wrong with everyone? This is madness. This is not madness. This is lump. However, Francine once again starts to doubt herself. It's a lump. It's not good. Who cares? They love it. Doubt comes in. The wind is changing. Despite Klaus telling her to lie through her teeth, she tries to tell them she did not make the lump. How did you come up with the lump? I didn't. You're saying the lump was already out there and you're just the conduit? Oh my god, you're such an idiot. I'm just saying, in a way, she kind of did. Even if it wasn't her original idea, it still came from her own two hands. And I'm sure she could do the bowls. Maybe it's a throwback to her old work. I feel like I'm in the Twilight Zone. It's pronounced Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone out. But she does have a point. Rod Sterling isn't there, and it's not black and white. In the process, Francine accidentally makes a new art piece. Shards. I made this! <laughs> Shards are the new lump! We saw her process! It happened on our show! They are representative of the hollow feeling we all feel. And if we allow ourselves to be seen, if only a little, the illusion cracks into shards. Francine starts to go crazy and thinks, wait, my family is supportive of me for once. True, white rice is still fresh in my mind because I had it for dinner the other night. And maybe also Francine's mind as another way she's messed up and the laughter felt like bullets. But she starts to go crazy and finds a mental hospital across the street. Almost as if it's waiting for her. Oh, it's fun there, I hear. Even though I've never actually been to one. Lucky. Franny should be used to it. I mean, remember American Fung? Wait, did that episode actually happen? I don't know. Francine talks to the dude in charge. I guess the head doctor? The doctor dude understands, and he admits Francine. But as she's not suffering from a mental illness, just crushing insecurity, she will have her worthiness determined by the director of the mental hospital. I understand. If everyone loves everything you do, how do you know if you're actually worthy of it? Well, there's a special ward in this hospital where you can get that answer. By the all-seeing eye, we are worthy. We are not. You're waiting your turn to see the director. The director will determine your worthiness. Wait, I want to try to edit down her voice. Hold on. You're waiting your turn to see the director. The director will determine your worthiness. How did that sound. Obviously, I have no way of knowing beforehand. Franny gets used to her new living arrangements. Bread? Love bread. The rest of this mental hospital? Zero stars. Same Z's, I love bread, but microwaved, not like that. Free stars, they are at least providing anemones. Before Francine sees the director, she starts to hear rumors about said director being a creepy monster, or evil, or perhaps both. Then shards. Hmm. Maybe shards are good. Francine tries to leave, but stuff happens and she is ready for her interview with the director, which, as the graffiti implied, is a big scary monster. Oh wait, it's just a kid who looks like Francine without lipstick in a cow costume. You're a kid. I'm the director? 
of this mental hospital. Yeah, I'm just ripping the band-aid off now. That's Francine as a little kid. I'm guessing this is her insecurity or her subconscious or both, but yes, that's Francine. Off topic, but I do like the voice actress for Kid Francine. She matches the cadence with Wendy Schall perfectly. Also the inflection, like give this kid an award. Hey, that's my move. Now, I don't know how she was able to do that. The American Dad crew have been kind of open about the fact that cast members don't record together. Although, they do table reads together and meet up at, like, Comic-Cons. And considering how this episode aired in 2023, I wouldn't be surprised again if it was recorded at home. I'm sure it was probably something like she just watched specific scenes or was shown Wendy's recordings or stuff like that. Or or hey, maybe they have a good vocal director, or maybe this was the one time Wendy came out with another voice actor, but it's always fun to wonder. The director determines that she's not worthy, and her sentence will be Woody's punishment from Toy Story 2. You're not worthy. You're bad and you belong in the garbage forever. Go, get in there. Francine willingly accepts this. Oh my God, that is kind of sad. But she has one final request. Just really quick, cause it's gonna bother me. Have we met? You seem really familiar. See, I told you, that's Francine as a kid. Oh my God, you're me. This is... Probably not happening. Ta! But good twist, by the way. Francine realizes she has such insecurities because, as a child, she faced criticism over a mug she made in kindergarten. Don't you remember? I made that mug in kindergarten, and everyone laughed. And, and the, the laughter, laughter felt, felt like, like bullets. Aww. Well, maybe the other kids didn't realize she made such sloppy work because first off, she was a child, and second, she was left-handed, and lefties are the devil's minions. So she was probably told, you better use your right hand or I'ma beat you with this side of beef. Kitty, it's Lent. Oh yeah, then I guess they used mackerel. Well, I only know it's Lent because I see all of those ads for fish sandwiches. And when However, Francine comes to another realization. Yes, she was made fun of, but she had fun making the mug. And the fact all of those kids made fun of her, that set something off in her, and it created an insecurity to this day. She needed to be perfect. Her work needed to be perfect, because it was the only way she could avoid the bullying, or the idea she could be bullied. But I'm remembering it was fun to make. It's a flop. Well, I love it. I mean, again, remember White Rice? How did she feel after she had a really good stand-up career? That she was actually successful as an artist, and then her show gets canceled after one joke. You deserve a little fun. I'd really love it if you came with me. And I guess this leads to the moral of the episode. If you're not good at something artistic, unless that's your job, why does it matter? I mean, so long as you're not drawing anything illegal or stuff like that. Again, there's only one question you need to ask. Are you having fun? If you say yes, then keep on doing it. Yes, it sucks being bullied. I've been there. And it's a harsh lesson to learn that even the best artist is going to be criticized or have detractors. But speaking from experience, nine times out of ten, it's not that bad. I mean, I'll be honest, outside of YouTubing, I'm actually a horrible artist. I'm awful at drawing, pottery, arts and crafts, singing, heck, homemade cosplays, but they're fun to make, so I like to keep on doing it. Heck, like we saw here, even the so-called experts, they might have started off just like you. Trey Parker might have made a stupid cutout that everybody made fun of when he was four. And now he runs his own show. He has a cool house, a great family, and he owns his own restaurant. And with the experts, maybe they have the same insecurities as you do. They judge themselves as harshly. They're their harshest critics. Again, there's nothing wrong with being quote-unquote average when it comes to making something artistic. For every 
every success story you hear, there's 50 more stories of failures. Or average artists who, while they aren't rich and famous, they still manage to get by by doing stuff that they love. Heck, again, I don't even consider myself that big of a YouTuber because there will always be somebody bigger than I am. I'll probably never get to cameo in Five Nights at Freddy's or have a South Park episode based around me, and I don't care. I'm fine with that. Francine finally makes peace with herself, and we get the moment that almost makes me cry every single time I watch it. But I don't know what's out there. It's just the world, and you deserve to be part of it. Come on, I got you. It's really so sweet. Francine, you've been in there for half an hour. I'm starting to worry that I'm going to poop my pants. Ew. Besides, are you really that lazy? Considering how huge this house is, there's probably like 10 hundred other bathrooms you could choose from. However, Francine ignores this, and she ends up going back outside, now confident about her pottery, even if it's just a stupid hobby. I just had the world's most productive panic attack. Okay, cool. And do people care? Eh, some do, some don't. But what's most important is she doesn't care. And the next thing we know, she and her child self are at peace. They're content. They're busy at work making more pottery and having fun and not breaking anything. Wow, I love this episode so much. I told you it's relatable for me in the best way. If you're an artist, we've all been there. Getting bullied and yeah, a lot of it hurts. But it's important to remember. Did you have fun? Then it's okay. And if it's a hobby, you don't mind keeping up, good on you. Anyhow, I don't really know what else to say besides donate to the cause, and this weekend I will be at AwesomeCon. I will be presenting a Pokemon trivia panel on Friday and doing cosplay meetups and doing cosplay meetups for South Park, FNAF, and Venture Brothers. I can't wait to see you there. Um, bye.